Welcome to Dwella of the Dark. We are a channel honoring the yellowed and blackened bones of many prominent authors. We will be digging up several obscure, strange, and forgotten authors who influenced many of the great horror, science fiction, and fantasy writers today. Comment below if you like. If you have authors that you'd like to see recognized, list them in the comments or contact our author page. Subscribe for more tales of the horrifying, obscure, strange, and forgotten. We'll have quite a collection climbing out of the tombs. If you like any of our tales, ring the bell and crush the like button below. Authors, the Skull and Bones collection has risen. Send us more flesh to feed this beast. Check out our other stories on YouTube and our websites. YouTube, Rumble, Bitch Shoot. Dweller of the Dark. Official website, dwellerofthedark.com. You can find us on Facebook at Jeffrey LeBlanc, Horror Writer. Our books are on Amazon, Kindle, Kindle Vella. Follow us, support us on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, Bandcamp. Dweller of the Dark. Children of Horror. We dedicate tonight's tale, Ambrose Bierce's The Isle all pines to the slithering serpent in the sepulcher Stephen Hoy enjoy the Isle of Pines by Ambrose Bierce first published in 1888 for the San Francisco Examiner for many years there lived near the town of Gallipolis, Ohio, an old man named Herman DeLuce. Very little was known of his history, for he would neither speak of it himself nor suffer others. It was a common belief among his neighbors that he had been a pirate, if upon any better evidence than his collection of boarding pikes, cutlasses, and ancient flintlock pistols. No one knew. He lived entirely alone in a small house of four rooms, falling rapidly into decay and never repaired further than was required by the weather. It stood on a slight elevation in the midst of a large stony field overgrown with brambles and cultivated in patches and only in the most primitive way. It was his only visible property but could hardly have yielded him a living, simple and few as were his wants. He seemed always to have ready money and paid cash for all his purchases at the village stores round about, seldom buying more than two or three times at the same place until after the lapse of a considerable time. He got no commendation, however, for this equitable distribution of his patronage, people were disposed to regard it as an ineffectual attempt to conceal his possession of so much money that he had great hordes of ill-gotten gold buried somewhere about his tumble-down dwelling was not reasonably to be doubted by any honest soul conversant with the facts of local tradition and gifted with a sense of the fitness of things. On the 9th of November, 1867, the old man died. At least his dead body was discovered on the 10th and physicians testified that death had occurred about 24 hours previously 
Precisely how? They were unable to say. For the post-mortem examination showed every organ to be absolutely healthy with no indication of disorder or violence. According to them, death must have taken place about noonday, yet the body was found in bed. The verdict of the coroner's jury was that he came to his death by a visitation of God. The body was buried and the public administrator took charge of the estate. A rigorous search disclosed nothing more than was already known about the dead man and much patient excavation here and there about the premises by thoughtful and thrifty neighbors went unrewarded. The administrator locked up the house against the time when the property, real and personal, should be sold by law with a view to defraying partly the expenses of the sale. The night of November 20th was boisterous. A furious gale stormed across the country, scourging it with desolating drifts of sleet. Great trees were torn from the earth and hurled across the roads. So wild a night had never been known in all that region, but toward morning the storm had blown itself out of breath, and day dawned bright and clear. At about eight o'clock that morning, the Reverend Henry Galbraith, a well-known and highly esteemed Lutheran minister, arrived on foot at his house, a mile and a half from the Deleuze place. Mr. Galbraith had been for a month in Cincinnati. He had come up the river in a steamboat and landing at Gallipolis the previous evening had immediately obtained a horse and buggy and set out for home. The violence of the storm had delayed him overnight and in the morning the fallen trees had compelled him to abandon his conveyance and continue his journey afoot. Where did you pass the night? inquired his wife after he had briefly related his adventure. With old Deleuze at the Isle of Pines was the laughing reply and the glum enough time I had of it. He made no objection to my remaining not a word could I get out of him. Fortunately, for the interest of truth, there was present at this conversation Mr. Robert Mosley Marin, a lawyer and literateur of Columbus, the same who wrote the delightful Mellowcraft papers, noting, but apparently not sharing, the astonishment caused by Mr. Galbraith's answer, this ready-witted person checked by a gesture the exclamations that would naturally have followed and tranquilly inquired, How came you to go in there? This is Mr. Marin's version of Mr. Galbraith's reply. I saw a light moving about the house and being nearly blinded by the sleet and half frozen besides drove in at the gate and put up my horse in the old rail stable where it is now i then rapped at the door and getting no invitation went in without one the room was dark but having matches, I found a candle and lit it. I tried to enter 
the adjoining room, but the door was fast, and although I heard the old man's heavy footsteps in there, he made no response to my calls. There was no fire on the hearth, so I made one and laying down for it with my overcoat under my head, prepared myself for sleep. Pretty soon, the door that I had tried silently opened and the old man came in carrying a candle. I spoke to him pleasantly, apologizing for my intrusion, but he took no notice of me. He seemed to be searching for something, though his eyes were unmoved in their sockets. I wonder if he ever walks in his sleep. He took a circuit a part of the way round the room and went out the same way he had come in. Twice more before I slept, he came back into the room acting precisely the same way and departing as at first. In the intervals, I heard him tramping all over the house, his footsteps distinctly audible in the pauses of the storm. When I woke in the morning, he had already gone out. Mr. Marin attempted some further questioning but was unable longer to restrain the family's tongues. The story of Deleuze's death and burial came out greatly to the good minister's astonishment. The explanation of your adventure is very simple, said Mr. Marin. I don't believe old Deleuze walks in his sleep. Not in his present one, but you evidently dream in yours. And to this view of the matter, Mr. Galbraith was compelled reluctantly to assent. Nevertheless, a late hour of the next night found these two gentlemen accompanied by a son of the minister in the road in front of the old Deleuze house. There was a light inside. It appeared now at one window and now at another. The three men advanced to the door. Just as they reached it, there came from the interior a confusion of the most appalling sound. A flash of weapons. Steel against steel. Sharp explosions as of firearms, shrieks of women, groans, and the curses of men in combat. The investigators stood a moment, irresolute, frightened. Then Mr. Galbraith tried the door. It was fast, but the minister was a man of courage, a man, moreover, of Herculean strength. He retired a pace or two and rushed against the door, striking it with his right shoulder and bursting it from the frame with a loud crash. In a moment, the three were inside. Darkness and silence. The only sound was the beating of their hearts. Mr. Marin had provided himself with matches and a candle. With some difficulty begotten of his excitement, he made a light and they proceeded to explore the place, passing from room to room. Everything was in orderly arrangement as it had been left by the sheriff. Nothing had been disturbed. A light coating of dust was everywhere. A back door was partly open, as if by neglect, 
and their first thought was that the authors of the awful revelry might have escaped. The door was opened, and the light of the candle shone through upon the ground. The expiring effort of the previous night's storm had been a light fall of snow. There were no footprints. The white surface was unbroken. They closed the door and entered the last room of the four that the house contained. That farthest from the road in an angle of the building. Here the candle in Mr. Marin's hand was suddenly extinguished as by a draught of air. Almost immediately followed the sound of a heavy fall. When the candle had been hastily relighted, young Mr. Galbraith was seen prostrate on the floor at a little distance from the others. He was dead. In one hand, the body grasped a heavy sack of coins, which later examination showed to be all of old Spanish mintage. Directly over the body as it lay, a board had been torn from its fastenings in the wall, and from the cavity so disclosed it was evident that the bag had been taken. Another inquest was held. Another post-mortem examination failed to reveal a probable cause of death. Another verdict of the visitation of God left all at liberty to form their own conclusions. Mr. Marin contended that the young man died of excitement. Thank you for listening. Have a great night.